They have a problem. They're running a deficit of 20 to $40 billion a year. They've got um, $50 billion of gold. How do you solve the problem? Simple. Sell all the gold and convert it to Bitcoin. Uh, the gold is going to continue to lose power over time. It's not appreciating. There's, there's no way that gold is going to go up in value by a factor of 100. It just won't do it. It's a dead rock. If Turkey sold the $50 billion in gold and they bought $50 billion in Bitcoin, Bitcoin would appreciate in value by a factor of 3, 4, 5, 6. Everybody in the world would start to realize that their gold is a dead rock and they would sell bill, uh, first billions, then tens of billions, then hundreds of billions, then trillions of dollars of gold. The uh, $12 trillion of, of energy or capital in gold would probably get demonetized down to about $2 trillion because that's the utility value of gold is jewelry. Bitcoin would explode from 500 billion to trillions to 10 trillion to 20 trillion. Turkey would be sitting on top of first $250 billion of Bitcoin, but that's going to appreciate at anywhere from 10 to 20% a year. So Turkey would end up generating $50 billion of asset gains a year, which would offset their 20 to $40 billion you know, deficit they're running. Their currency would be backed by Bitcoin, right? It's, it, it, if gold was enough to back the currency, the lira wouldn't be crashing right now. It's, gold, is, it, gold is an idea for the 19th century, and it was the best idea for sound money in the 19th century. But in the 21st century, the problem with gold is people keep making more of it. It's just the king commodity, but commodities don't make good money because ultimately... The problem with it is you can keep making more of it and the bankers keep rehypothecating it and they print too much paper gold. Hello and welcome to the Flying Frisbee podcast with me, Dominic Frisbee. It's my pleasure today to welcome to the show Michael Saylor. Michael is a, an American entrepreneur. He's the founder and chairman of the uh, NASDAQ-listed tech company MicroStrategy and I'm sure you're familiar uh, with him because he has been one of the most articulate spokespeople about Bitcoin uh, over the last two or three years. So, Michael, thanks very much for joining me on the show. I should say thank you very much for dinner because we met uh, at your house. I had dinner there <laughs> during the Bitcoin conference. I, I ate a lovely steak. So thank you very much for that. And why don't we start with, you know, where do you see Bitcoin at the moment? What is the state of Bitcoin? Well, I think Bitcoin is poised for the next great bull run right now. Um, we've, uh, we've moved through uh, a difficult year of rationalization. And if you roll the clock back about 12 months, uh, the entire crypto industry was fairly confusing, uh, fairly chaotic. But there was Terra, there was Luna. If I go through all of the meltdowns, Terra, Luna, Three Arrows, you know, uh, Genesis, Voyager, Celsius, BlockFi, Alameda, FTX, right? Uh, a ca each of those cascading, uh, taking us into uh, 2023, where now we have just a, a barrage of regulator lawsuits against uh, DeFi exchanges, against crypto tokens, against crypto exchanges, against crypto staking protocols, and um, if I were to look at the big picture, I would say our, the big picture for uh, Bitcoin is it's trading somewhere near the four-year simple moving average. So normally it, it, in bull runs, it moves above that simple moving average, and then uh, bear markets drive it kind of down to the moving average. But if you think about the four-year simple moving average, it means that for the past 1,400 days, people have been paying this much or more for Bitcoin. So I think of Bitcoin is like a, a bank in cyberspace. And when people buy Bitcoin, they're putting their money in a, in a bank. So if you ask the question, how much did everybody deposit in the bank? Looking at that four year simple moving average kind of gives you an idea that for the most part, that's the amount of money that was put in the bank. If I was trying to come up with like a book value for Bitcoin, I would look at the at the four year moving average for for Bitcoin. If if tomorrow Bitcoin was trading, it just jumped up to a hundred thousand dollars. 
a coin on low volume and it was four times a simple moving average, you would say, well, that's a bit rich. But if, if tomorrow it spiked down to $5,000 and you're saying, well, it's like 20% the simple moving average, you would say, well, it's, it seems like that's being artificially suppressed. Everyone that actually bought into Bitcoin paid a lot more than that. And so they're probably not going to sell for that. So I see Bitcoin as having a pretty strong fundamental base here. If I look at all the things holding it back, um, 25,000 coins or crypto token confusion, that holds it back. If you're not sure about the difference between BTC and FTT and Terra Luna, that holds it back. You know, when, when UST and FTT and, and Luna and the like, when they all melt down, then there's a lot less confusion. Uh, not knowing the difference between the Bitcoin network and the FTT network, if they're both equal, like if, if FTT is just a much quicker, cheaper, less energy intensive version of Bitcoin, I mean, they're both blockchain things, that holds it back. At the end of the day, of course, FTT was like backed by a couple of people and you pin prick it and it collapses to zero. Uh, and uh, Bitcoin is backed by 400 exahash, which means more energy than the entire U.S. Navy uses and more computer power than all the other computers on Earth combined. Right. If you understood it like that, you would say, well, Bitcoin is the is the most powerful, secure computer network and the other tokens were just kind of spun up tokens. So over the last 12 months, everyone that thought it was a good idea to short Bitcoin went bankrupt. Everybody in the business of taking your Bitcoin and then loaning it to someone else who's going to invest in a DeFi crypto token protocol went bankrupt. Everyone uh, that was uh, not committed to holding Bitcoin for the long term, but willing to loan their Bitcoin to another crypto bank to rehypothecate it went bankrupt. And so what you've got is and everyone that thought that FTT token or Luna token was just as good as Bitcoin, they're either bankrupt or they're bankrupt and on the run or bankrupt and about to be in jail. And so what's happening here, right? The free market is shaking out all the crypto pretenders. All, all the next Bitcoins are getting shaken out. And FTT is obviously not the next Bitcoin. Solana and, you know, and Cardano are obviously not the next Bitcoin. They're unregistered securities, according to the SEC, which means they're not commodities at all. And if you're not a commodity, you can't be a global money or a global property because you're going to be regulated. There's an attack surface. Like if you are a registered security, you're not going to be a global property like Apple and, and Microsoft and Facebook and Alibaba are not going to be global properties because they're registered, regulated securities. But certainly an unregistered security is definitely not going to be a global property. It's not even as good as Apple. And Apple is 100 times weaker as a property idea than, uh, than Bitcoin is because it's a uh, security, not a commodity. So we've had 12 months of regulatory clarity. We've had 12 months of, uh, of shakeout of, uh, of unwise leverage and foolish leverage in the system. We've had 12 months of people that are lukewarm supporters having their Bitcoin taken away from them. It's unfortunate. It's tragic in many ways. But if you trust your Bitcoin to an altcoiner like Sam Bankman Freed, well, he crashed his altcoins and he also took your Bitcoin and he panic sold your Bitcoin. So who's left holding Bitcoin right now? Right. It's the true believers. You know, what's the price of Bitcoin? It's trading near the four year simple moving average. It's not trading up at 60,000 where it was like at three or four times the four year moving average. It's got a strong base in it. The regulators are cleaning up the space. The message in the United States and Western Europe clearly is the future of crypto is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the one thing every crypto exchange can buy, can sell, can hold. Um, the accounting treatment for, for digital assets like Bitcoin is being clarified. And if we move from indefinite and tangible accounting to fair value accounting, it opens the door for Microsoft and Google and Amazon and Facebook to buy billions and billions of dollars of Bitcoin and carry it as a, a, as a, a treasury asset. So I like all the fundamentals. I don't like how we got here. It's been painful. But, um, you know, there, there's no simple way to introduce uh, you know, a new idea into the world. And there wasn't going to be a simple way uh, 
to educate the entire marketplace on the benefits of Bitcoin. So all things considered, I think we've uh, made a lot of progress in 12 months. Do you think, I, I think that fair value accounting that you mentioned there is very uh, significant in its implications. How likely is it, my finger's just not on the pulse of accounting, so I don't know, how likely is it that, that it is going to become a thing, as you described? Well, right now, the consensus in the in the community is that, including the accounting community and the FASB committee working on this, is that it's going to happen. So we believe it will happen. Uh, the uh, the procedure has been public, and you can track it. They move through about three stages of the procedure, and and at every stage, um, it's been uh, the idea of moving from the current indefinite intangible accounting to fair value accounting has been reaffirmed. There doesn't seem to be any substantial dissent anywhere within the FASB or outside in the industry so is or from FASB regulators. The, is FASB the American Accounting Association or something? Fa FASB is the, is the global uh, uh, accounting body that controls gap accounting or provides gap accounting guidance. So they're the uh, regulator or they're the, they're the accounting organization that will provide the guidance that all publicly traded companies and all gap based companies will follow. Okay. And so they're running the process and all of their, um, all of their process is public. You can follow it. And the guidance right now that we hear from accountants is that sometime toward the end of this year, they'll give definitive guidance, which means that in 2024, I would suppose, companies that are holding Bitcoin or buying Bitcoin or considering it will have a much stronger accounting treatment, a much more beneficial accounting treatment for carrying it on their balance sheet. I have to say, during the last bull market, one of the things that got me most excited about the potential of Bitcoin was, and it was a narrative that you, you know, very much espoused, was this thing of corporate entities holding treasury in Bitcoin. And obviously MicroStrategy does it, a few others do it. But it hasn't become a mainstream thing. And but corporate buying, you know, the implications of corporate buying are a lot more significant, perhaps, than the end of it, than the implications of retail investors buying. So that would be transformative. Yeah, it's it's really not possible for a gap based corporation to buy this in volume when you have indefinite intangible accounting. Indefinite intangible accounting is the, is the accounting treatment you would give to any asset, any asset you wanted people not to buy. Like if I, if I was certain I did not want you to buy it, I would assign indefinite intangible accounting treatment to it. Because what it means is you can never generate an investment gain. You can only generate investment losses. They ratchet down to zero. And um, you can't even book them as investment losses. They, they end up being booked as, as operating losses. So if Facebook were to buy $10 billion of Bitcoin and make $100 billion on it, but Bitcoin traded down 50% before they made the $100 billion, what the world would see is that Facebook's core business made no money, that they mm -hmm. lost $5 billion in the core business because it's an operating loss. And then they, the world would think that they had $5 billion in assets instead of $100 billion in assets. So you see, <laughs> there's no way the CFO of Facebook is going to take that kind of volatility and toxicity on their P&L. It screws up all the operating reporting and it also screws up the balance sheet. So that's why it hasn't happened. Uh, the reason uh, that fair value accounting is so much better is because fair value accounting splits the balance sheet accounting from the P&L accounting. So when I buy the 10 billion, if my core business made 5 billion, then I show a $5 billion operating gain. And then if Bitcoin trades down 50%, I show a $5 billion investment loss. So I separate the two. So investors in about 10 seconds can see that there's no problem with the core business and that the, and that the volatility came in the uh, balance sheet. And then when Bitcoin, if it were to go back to 10,000, you'd show a $5 billion investment gain the next quarter. And so you reverse it. And if it were to go up by a factor of 10, you would show $90 billion of investment gains to follow, you see. So, but when you have the gains, when you have $5 or $10 billion of investment gains per quarter, you would separate that from the $5 billion of operating income a quarter. So if you're an outside investor, you can say, okay, I can see this is the balance sheet contribution to the, P to, to the earnings. This is the operating contribution to the earnings. If you're um, a CFO, you can defend that. Now, imagine if I collapse that and I said, well, there, is the ba there are no investment gains and your operating results are awful. 
and now you're the CFO and you have to go in front of your outside shareholders and explain how you screwed up the core business and the balance sheet is show, has nothing to show for it. Okay, now, now you've got a problem, right? So, so uh, you can't really expect a big publicly traded company with a healthy business and uh, a set of shareholders that understand the core business uh, to really want to get heavily into Bitcoin. That's why the Teslas and the, mm -hmm. the blocks of the world, they've invested, you know, you can invest 5% of your capital or 2% of your capital. But when you get to the point where you invest 50% of your capital and you could have a material swing in the quarter, it becomes very confusing. So yeah, the accounting does matter and, uh, and it'll be beneficial uh, when uh, it goes to fair value accounting. Well, I, I'm, that, that really excites me because on, on top of the accounting, there's just the individual career risk. And many people, especially in corporations, they just don't want to do anything too wacky or too wild or too bold. You know, you do need people such as yourself who, who would sort of prepare to take the plunge are unusual um, in, in that sort of corporate world. And, and so the, it, a change of the accounting system changes the career risk as well as, as, well as the actual accounting itself. Yeah, uh, if you want to introduce a new asset class, and when's the last asset class introduced into the corporate world, right? Like, like uh, not, in, not in our lifetime has there been a new one. I mean, people, corporate treasurers have basically invested in sovereign debt, treasury bonds or corporate bonds, maybe, uh, for the last 50 years. So you want to introduce a new asset class. Well, you need to, you need to um, normalize the accounting you also mm -hmm. need to normalize the regulatory disclosures, like the SEC disclosures. There's a, there's a lot of nuance about, well, how do I even disclose uh, what I've got on my balance sheet and how it affected my P&L, right? And so the accounting drives that. And then you have to normalize the, uh, the guidelines for banks. Like, is a bank allowed to own or hold Bitcoin? And how is it treated as collateral versus having uh, real estate loans or securities or sovereign debt on your balance sheet. So, you know, uh, we've been working on this for three years, right? The accounting, and, the accounting industry has been working on it for three years since 2020. It's 2023, so maybe uh, over the course of four years, they will evolve. Generally, the regulators will evolve over two, three, four years, but I mean, a year is like light speed. It doesn't happen in a year. No. Four years is more likely. So I think that, um, when we go into 2024, I think there'll be a lot more clarity about a lot of these disclosures. Just, just like, for example, the entire crypto industry is now starting to realize that there's a difference between FTT token and Solana and BTC. But, you know, 12 months ago, there was mass, there would be massive debate getting people to accept the idea that there's something like a crypto security. Mm -hmm. The entire word crypto asset security that has been introduced and, and adopted in the crypto industry. But 24 months ago, they didn't have that phrase. Like people didn't recognize that. They weren't willing to even embrace this issue. So you can't really move forward until um, the body of uh, industry investors understand the difference between a, a digital currency, a digital security, a digital token, and a digital commodity. And, you know, 24 months ago, people didn't understand the difference. In fact, you have not, to get I'm every not even senator. I'm sure I do now, Michael. Okay, so yeah. that's, the, that's the primary point. Every senator, every congressperson, every governor, every mayor, every billionaire, every corporate CFO, every journalist in the finance industry has to understand the difference between those things before we can move forward. A digital commodity would be an asset without an issuer like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. A digital security would be a digital asset with an issuer like Solana or like Algorand, where you've got a, a controlling body that creates it, creates the protocol, mm -hmm. and they govern it. A digital currency would be a stable coin like Circle or like Tether. It purports to be the U.S. dollar as a bearer instrument and a digital asset. A digital token might very well be like an NFT, like a mm -hmm. piece of art, right? And it might be a non-fungible token. It might be one of one, or it might be Tom Brady coin, right? The yeah. 10,000 super fan coins that Tom Brady issues, and they all get to come to his house for a barbecue every, every month, right? 
So if you understand those things to be different, then a digital exchange is something that could trade them all, right? Mm -hmm. and now, then is this your definition or are these sort of generally accepted definitions? I'm not sure. If they were generally accepted, there wouldn't be so much divisive debate. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I suppose they're my definitions, but they're not, I'm, but uh, I'm not inventing them out of whole cloth. I'm just pointing out the obvious. I, yeah. Okay. I know the definition of a currency. I know the definition of a security. I know the definition of a commodity, right? I, I've seen a token. So if you want to actually move forward in a constructive, non-divisive way, you have to have a universally acknowledged taxonomy of digital assets. If you want to actually create a digital assets industry in your country, you have to have a legitimate digital asset framework, right? And then you have to have political consensus that it's okay to issue those assets, trade those assets, and custody those assets. Now, we don't have that consensus. For example, uh, you know, there are a lot, of, a lot of jurisdictions where they don't want you to be able to move a million dollars of stable coin from point A to point B, no KYC. Right. That's that would be called money laundering. OK, mm -hmm. so, so there's no consensus. You should even be able to do that. Right. Um, there's no consensus that you should be able to trade uh, security 24-7. Uh, For example, MicroStrategy or M Microsoft stock. If you own Microsoft stock, how do you trade that on Saturday afternoon between an Indian national and a Pakistani national? And if you wanted to take custody of your Microsoft shares on your hardware wallet. How do you do that? Complex is, derivatives. Well, you can't do that. Now, the point is you can't do it right now. There is no legal path to do it. But should you be able to do it, right? Like, should you be able to trade Apple stock on Saturday? You, you can't right now. Apple is a security. It trades on NASDAQ, right? Yeah, you can trade securities on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ if they're issued pursuant to... 20th century rules, but there's no Presumably way Presumably there's some them. way of trading a promise to buy and sell uh, uh, Apple stock at the weekend. Yeah, well, my, the point I'm making is there's no way to do it now, but okay. there's no debate over whether you should be able to do it. No one's even suggesting you should. Okay. If you look at the crypto debate, if you look at all of all the people on crypto Twitter, if you look at all the congressional hearings, no one has suggested that they would like to trade Apple stock on a crypto exchange on Saturday. You see, they've been fighting for the right to issue Luna coin, you know, minted by Doquan. Well, that, I mean, that's, you know, sh you know, do you really want, you know, an, a set of three entrepreneurs in a garage to be able to mint their own security without disclosures and sell billions of dollars of it to the general public? Well, I mean, that, that's not a complicated question. I mean, the answer is probably not, right? That, that's mm -hmm. a pump and dump scheme of a penny stock. So the crypto industry is often fighting for that. The regulators are saying we won't allow that. And the two sides are fight are they're talking past each other. Mm -hmm. Because the real interesting question would be why can't I issue Apple stock and trade it on Saturday? And no one's even fighting for that. No one's asking that question. So, and, and the reason they're not fighting for that is no one's even defined the definition of a digital security. Like, does a digital, is a digital security a, a security of a publicly traded company that can trade on Saturday on a crypto exchange? Well, I would think it would be. Like, like why, if, if it's legal and ethical to trade Apple stock on Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., why isn't it legal and ethical to trade Apple stock on Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m.? That's the question, right? And that's, as, as often is the case in politics, the most important questions aren't even debated. The trivial questions are debated to no effect. So we're not really making any progress on a digital assets framework because people are debating the wrong questions. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're not trying to, uh, to establish the right framework. So if you, if you boil it all down, the only thing that's clear is Bitcoin's going to continue to succeed because Bitcoin's a simple idea. Digital property as a store of value. Very simple idea. How much demand is there for that? $100 trillion of demand for that. Right? There's a lot of demand for that. Everybody on earth wants to keep their money forever. Right? There, how much mm -hmm. money is there you want to keep forever? Hundreds and hundreds of trillions of dollars. So the simple idea uh, will continue uh, to prosper. 
the complex ideas, should you be able to, you know, self custody a million dollars of digital assets in the form of a stable coin on an Android phone? Should you be able to self custody a million dollars of Apple stock on an Android phone in India? Should you be able to trade with a counterparty that you don't know via smart contract? Should you be able to buy a perpetual swap derivative on Saturday night that represents a registered public company? Should you be able to borrow against, if I have $10 million of Apple stock and I live in India, should I be able to borrow against that from any counterparty in the world on Saturday afternoon getting the best bid? These are complicated ideas. Are they good ideas? Yeah, sure, they're good ideas. Would they make capital formation easier and move it faster? Sure, they would. But there isn't any politician that's put forth that coherent framework yet. There is no regulator putting forth that framework. And in the crypto industry, they're really in a defensive mode. They're fighting to defend their currency, their tokens, and their exchanges. And for the most part, the entire debate has been more divisive, like we're better than Bitcoin or something mm -hmm. like that, uh, as opposed to constructive. Like, like Bitcoin solves this problem. We want to solve that problem. Will you give us uh, a way to solve that problem? And uh, so I think, um, I think what will happen uh, is that we will, uh, we will continue to see Bitcoin move forward, but there will be a lot of chaos and confusion and conflict in the rest of the crypto industry as, uh, as every uh, regulatory environment sorts out how it wants to deal with these things. Mm -hmm. And there won't, be, uh, there won't be a clean solution. It won't come fast. Yeah. I like... I'm a big believer in narratives and stories. And I think narratives and stories drive markets. They drive how people think. And we spoke about this a little bit at your house, uh, which is why I think you were so brilliant in the last bull market is you you sort of took the, the Bitcoin story forward and pushed new narratives about it. And the narratives really took hold and that helped get the bull market going. You know, the whole thing of money being stored energy and all that kind of thing. And. I'm looking around now and going, what are the new narratives that are going to drive Bitcoin forward in the next bull market? And straight away, corporate buying of Bitcoin, that's a huge story. Um, the, and, and, you know, we're talking about international corporations, so they kind of need an international store of value and uh, a digital store of value. And, uh, you know, what better international digital store of value than Bitcoin? So, but this is sort of very big end stuff. When, when, we, when we're in Miami, um, you spoke about um, the, the, the tiny, the use of the lightning network, of, for example, on Amazon. You know, I buy a book on Amazon uh, and then I, I give it a rating and I get a little reward of a lightning coin. And then I write a review and I get another little reward. And then the review gets lots of readers and I get another little reward. And then uh, the readers lead to book sales. So perhaps I get a tiny share in the book sales and so on. So that's a that's a. Uh, sort of at the upper end, opposite end of the scale, but it's a real kind of micro payments driver of Bitcoin adoption and usage. And you said that the technology for that is kind of already there. Again, the main barriers are regulatory. Should we? Can we talk about that kind of story for a little bit? Sure. Um, but but since you brought it up, I think it's important to note the really big idea is the separation of property from the earth or the digital transformation of property. There are hundreds of trillions of dollars of capital that are, that are tied up in property like buildings and land. And if you look at the wealthy around the world, um, they store a lot of their wealth in property assets. And in an inflationary environment, when you're inflating the money supply by 7% a year, the only, the only way to stay ahead of that is to have a balance sheet which is property heavy. So um, it, I, I would say there's, there's probably three drivers for Bitcoin's advancement. One is the digital transformation of property from physical property to digital property. The second is the conversion of corporate balance sheet from credit assets or, or debt assets, which are liabilities, to property assets, which are, which are actually assets that are appreciating in value, like Bitcoin. And the third driver is the digital transformation of money 
the ability to move money at the speed of light between uh, between uh, a corporation and their customers or their partners, and that's the lightning story. Mm -hmm. But but let me just touch on each of them because I think they're equally important. They're, they're very important ideas. One, if I have a billion dollar building in London, and if the and if the pound gets inflated by seven percent in supply, then the the currency I have loses 7% of its value between January 1st and the end of the year, the end of December. Sure. Can but I, building, I'm going to interrupt you one second, Michael. Yeah. We, got a, we have a thing called trueflation that tells you what real inflation actually is. I right. think you probably have it in the <clears throat> States. And in the UK, we're now at 12%. <laughs> it's okay. not even 7%. It's 12%. Now, I give you two companies. I give you a company that owns a billion dollars of land in London mm -hmm. or property. And I give you a company that has a billion dollars of um, debt, of, uh, of sovereign debt of the UK. Mm -hmm. On January 1st, if there's a 12% true inflation rate, <clears throat> the guy that owns the first company knows that his, his balance sheet is going to go up by 12% and he's going to make 121 million pounds by the end of the year. <clears throat> the guy that owns the second company is going to get a 3% yield and and the debt is going to lose 12% of its value. And so the guy that owns the second company is going to lose well well actually they're going to create by nominally by by 3% by 30 million pounds but their assets won't be worth anymore. So there's a 90 million pound difference between a a credit balance sheet or a debt laden balance uh, as I say credit you're owning credit of the US uh, of the UK government so the person that owns the the credit is 90 million pounds behind the person that owns the property and if you know if you just take it to the extreme you just own the cash well your cash is worth 12 percent less at the end of the year your balance sheet of property is keeping track so what you can see is that uh, over the course of 10 years companies that own property at that inflation rate are going to find their property value triples. And over the course of the same 10 years, the companies that just have the cash are going to have the same amount of cash, but it'll be worth one third as much or something. So the companies that are operating companies that are required to hold cash or cash equivalents are being bled to death and they're going to be bankrupted. And the companies that own property, the REITs, are going to keep up with the inflation. So the big idea here is uh, twofold. One, you don't really want to own billion dollar buildings in London. You want to own a billion dollars of a digital building that has no property tax that can move to any city in the world that can be upgraded with technology, right? There, there's a cost to owning the real estate. It's also, you can only buy the billion dollar building with a billion dollars of capital. But if you're a taxi cab driver in London, you want to acquire the building at 287 pounds a month. You know, you, you need to acquire incremental property. So digital property is better than physical property. And that means that you've got trillions and then tens of trillions and then hundreds of trillions of dollars of capital that should flow out of the buildings and the warehouses and the land into the Bitcoin network because digital property is, is just better lower maintenance, lower tax. You can buy it and sell it in smaller portions. You don't need to be a rich family in London with an army of lawyers in order to buy Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the first idea. The second idea is most can I, operating... Can I, can I uh, just talk about sure. something you just said there, just for one second? Yeah, go ahead. So if you, if you took like five se several different asset classes and you looked at the prices in 1970 and then you looked at the prices today and let's just say those things are um, real estate, uh, uh, tuition fees, uh, milk and eggs and phone calls, okay, and, or, and cars, let's say. Now, we've obviously seen incredible runaway inflation in real estate and tuition fees. But we've seen some inflation in milk and eggs, but it's nothing like the same inflation we've seen in real estate and tuition. Now, obviously, we've got better at making milk and eggs, and so the cost has come down. But I think the real difference is that we use credit to buy tuition and we use credit to buy real estate. And, you know, a lot of money gets created through the issuance of credit. 
And so you see the ballooning of those asset classes that involve credit to buy. You see runaway inflation with those relative to the runaway inflation of milk and eggs because we don't use we just use cash to buy milk and eggs. Now, do we use credit? I can see you sighing. <laughs> do we use credit to buy digital assets? Do you see what I mean? Will there be that yeah, so same driver? If you're looking at, it, at differential inflation, the reason that the real estate is going up fastest is you can't make any more of it, or it, it's hardest. You, you can technically make more. If, if you've got a 50-floor floor condo in London, you can punch another 50-floor condo up. So, so it's easier to make square footage, but it's hard to make acreage in London, and, and it's very hard to make city blocks in center city London in Chelsea or, or, or sure. the there's only so much land by the Thames and so, so, on. so conservative assets that, that the government can't make the, the government can't make more land and a company cannot make more land. And so that's going to go up the fastest rate. The reason that, um, that education is going up fast is because the government, ha uh, puts a monopoly on it. There's a restraint of trade and it's regulated. And uh, the fact of the matter is Harvard could issue 100,000 diplomas a year. They choose not to, right? There's, there's not an interest. You, you could give education for free to everybody on earth if you wanted to with 1 20th of the Department of Education budget. But education is meant to be a regulated, it's a regulated offer and they want to keep the price high and they want to keep the supply down. Like try get, if you're a doctor, in the UK, try to come and be a doctor in New York City, right? You're not licensed the same way. So mm -hmm. they don't really want um, to create lots and lots of those diplomas, especially not at Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and the government supports that through accreditation. Yeah. If you wanted to create a university to give education away to a billion people for free, it would take you a hundred years and thousands of lawyers to get the accreditations in each of the hundred countries mm. so it's to be a able to issue the diploma. Thing. Yeah. So, so education is regulated and wherever the government gets involved, they drive up the price. It isn't expensive because it's hard to produce. It's expensive because they make it specialized. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that milk and eggs don't go up at the same rate is they're commodities, which means the government doesn't, it doesn't control who can create them. And so the free market finds an intelligent way to create more of them. When the government does get involved and it puts in price controls and import controls and makes it illegal to import eggs, eggs will go up in price. And then, uh, and, and you see that with all commodities, drywall, lumber, human beings. Uh, if you ask the question, how hard is it to manufacture steel today versus how far hard was it to manufacture steel 2000 years ago? And then you go look at a modern steel factory and then you ask yourself the question, how likely is it that you yourself can figure out how to manufacture steel in your backyard? You realize that the key to a commodity becoming cheap is for the government to get out of the way and let human beings uh, find a way to manufacture a lot of it. And human beings get very good at manufacturing candy bars and steel and lumber and cars if the government doesn't get involved. The government is very involved in healthcare and is very involved in education. And so they prevent you from manufacturing lots of it cheap, mm -hmm. right? That's the role of government in those regulated areas. Now, the telephone call is an interesting one. That's an information service. Now, that's free now. Yeah. You can, you can telephone call with WhatsApp or Skype or voice over IP, and it's gone to zero. Mm -hmm. And the things that go to zero are, are information-rich uh, energy poor. Uh, they're, they're commodities that, are, that have a low energy content and a low uh, material content that are not regulated. And they, over time, will go to zero, like streaming Netflix or streaming YouTube videos or phone calls. Anything like that, if the government gets out of the way, will become zero. Now, education will actually go to zero if the government gets out of the way. Because algebra internet. has been well known, well understood for 2,000 years. And you can pretty much go online and get all of the algebra lessons you want, you know, on YouTube. Or you can learn them from the sailor.org for free. The thing that's holding up the cost of education is not the provision of the service. It's the certification of the degree, right? It's, it's the license 
to say that you're a trained computer scientist that's expensive, not the ability to learn to program mm. a computer. I get that. I'll give you... I, I, I totally buy all those arguments, Michael. I use the, um, the example of... a. Um, I suppose the, the double whammy is the scarcity, whether the scarcity is created by the availability of real estate, you know, on the Thames or whatever it is, uh, or the, the the scarcity of, you know, a Harvard education. But it's also the introduction of credit into a market where there's a finite supply and the two things together. Like if you take cars, there's not a scarcity of cars, but we use finance to buy cars. So car prices has, has you know, they've been appreciated a lot more than eggs and milk have. Um, so, yeah, if there's yeah, if there's cheap credit available, I mean, for example, if, if the government uh, creates an organization like Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and they give people two percent mortgages and everybody can borrow with loan to value of 100 percent at two percent, then home prices go up. Yeah. Right. So I, I think that's what you're getting at there. Oh, it's absolutely. And if there's no if we could only buy houses for cash. House prices would be a lot lower. But that's an, exa that's an example of another government subsidy, right? Absolutely. The government is subsidizing credit and it's creating uh, an inflationary bubble. True. I, you know, let's, I don't let's... have much more to say on that. I think the more important point is every company on earth that's required to hold its balance sheet in cash or cash equivalents is being bled 7 to 14% a year mm -hmm. by monetary inflation. And that's why all the companies fail. And that's why if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you want to be around in 100 years, you need a property company. With all, Your assets have to be property. They cannot be credit and they cannot be cash. And if you're trying to actually make money by doing something, like I'm a restaurant or I'm a hotel, the doing of something gets exponentially harder. When the money is – when the true inflation rate is 12%, you have to grow your cash flows by 12% in the UK this year in order to stand still. So statistically, 99% of companies cannot grow their cash flows 12% a year. You know, in a competitive market, if you don't have a monopoly, it's probably almost impossible for you to do that five years in a row. So when, when the, um, the political system creates a highly inflationary currency, if your business model is, uh, is to have no capital as property and be capital, capital weak or to hold credit as capital or cash as capital, then you have to literally grow your cash flows faster than the inflation rate. And that's why there's a 99% mortality rate on companies. That's what's destroying hundreds of thousands and millions of small businesses. And that's what causes monopolies to form in every sector in the world. It's because of the monetary policy of the government. It's such a shame. It just means, means it's impossible to build institutions that are going to last. On If you think of the Victorians in the 19th century, built all these institutions and these buildings, and you built them with hundred, you know, three, 400 years in the future in mind. It's just impossible now. So you know how you do it. You have to have an endowment. Mm -hmm. and, and the endowment has to hold non-cash instruments. Like if Oxford or Cambridge or if Harvard University or Yale, if they had an endowment that had cash, they would all be out of business. So the endowment has to have property type investments. And of course, the solution to all this is all those institutions, if you want your institution to last 500 years, whether it's your family or whether it's your church or whether it's your university or whether it's your country or your city or your government, you just endow it with Bitcoin. Right? Because Bitcoin is the apex property, it will appreciate at a faster rate than the currency will debase, and it has a lower maintenance cost than all the other property assets, and it's globally more scarce, more desirable. So there is a solution, but most institutions live in fear. Uh, they're either stuck in a fear uh, – uh, what is the word? Like a – a, f a doom loop or they're, or they're uh, stuck in a traditional view, which is the bank is not allowed to have Bitcoin because it's against the regulator's rules. The endowment is afraid to buy Bitcoin because they're afraid they'll be criticized by it. The company doesn't want to own Bitcoin because of gap accounting and that penalizes them. So they're, so they're either afraid of something new or they're afraid of the volatility or the accounting is prejudicial or their charter doesn't allow them to do it, 
or they don't know how to buy it because they don't they can't find a custodian or a trader they can trust. So so in the in the early stage it's a challenge for them to discover this and that's why education and advocacy is so important right now. But Bitcoin does represent the solution to the problem that ails the civilization right now. And the reason I wanted to focus upon that was because we're talking about $900 trillion of assets that are either cash equivalents or currency derivatives or currencies or defective assets or defective forms of property. And if half of that migrates into digital property, right, you're, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of trillions of dollars. It changes every family, every individual, every institution, every government, everywhere on earth. I'll give you I'll give you one more example. This is real right in front of our face right now. Turkey. Yeah. Struggling with the problem. Their currency has lost 96 percent of its value in the last 20 years. It's collapsing in front of our face. They have a problem. They're running a deficit of 20 to 40 billion dollars a year. They've got um, 50 billion dollars of gold. How do you solve the problem? Simple. Sell all the gold and convert it to Bitcoin. Uh, the gold is going to continue to lose power over time. It's not appreciating. There's, there's no way that gold is going to go up in value by a factor of 100. It just won't do it. It's a dead rock. If Turkey sold the 50 billion in gold and they bought 50 billion in Bitcoin, Bitcoin would appreciate in value by a factor of three, four, five, six. Everybody in the world would start to realize that their gold is a dead rock and they would sell bil uh, first billions, then tens of billions, then hundreds of billions, then trillions of dollars of gold. The uh, $12 trillion of, of energy or capital in gold would probably get demonetized down to about $2 trillion because that's the utility value of gold is jewelry. Bitcoin would explode from $500 billion to trillions to $10 trillion to $20 trillion. Turkey would be sitting on top of first $250 billion of Bitcoin, but that's going to appreciate at anywhere from 10 to 20% a year. So Turkey would end up generating $50 billion of asset gains a year, which would offset their 20 to $40 billion you know, deficit they're running. Their currency would be backed by Bitcoin, right? It's, it, it, if gold was enough to back the currency, the lira wouldn't be crashing right now. It's, gold is... It, gold is an idea for the 19th century, and it was the best idea for sound money in the 19th century. But in the 21st century, the problem with gold is people keep making more of it. It's just the king commodity, but commodities don't make good money because ultimately the problem with it is you can keep making more of it, and the bankers keep rehypothecating it, and they print too much paper gold. If you want to de defeat both of those defects— you need to make it possible to self-custody, and you need to eliminate the creation of more of it. And Bitcoin does both of those things. So you want to solve the problems of an entire country? You strap your entire economy onto Bitcoin. If Turkey were to sell the gold and buy Bitcoin, they would create two virtuous cycles. They would cause every other country to start selling their gold. And gold would, uh, would get shredded down to $2 trillion, and Bitcoin would leap up to $25 trillion. They would also create an avalanche of other mid-size and small countries buying Bitcoin. They would also create an avalanche of investors like the George Soroses of the world buying Bitcoin. Bitcoin would expand to be worth $10 trillion and then $100 trillion. Everyone that moves first ends up with a currency backed by Bitcoin. They actually solve the problem for, uh, for all the people in the nation. They solve their own problem. They fix the currency problem in the world. They can still keep the lira. The lira is now just backed by something much better. And, uh, and they would save all the companies in Turkey as well and, and solve a whole set of other human misery issues. Now, who can do this? A family can do it. If your family uh, did it in Turkey right now, you're in good shape. You're fine. If you've actually converted your assets to Bitcoin and you've taken custody or put it with a custodian outside of the country that you trust, you'll probably be okay. A company can do it. My company did it, Dominic. My company basically, um, we converted our balance sheet from cash and dollars to Bitcoin 
and our market cap increased by a factor of four. Our stock outperformed NASDAQ, the S&P index, bonds, gold, real estate, silver, everything. Our stock even outperformed Bitcoin for that matter. And so we actually converted ourselves to a Bitcoin standard. And, and we even, uh, we got to the point where we could sell a, we sold a billion dollars of stock, issued a billion dollars of stock at a price which was 5x the price of the stock when we started buying the Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So we were able to issue the stock and convert the stock into Bitcoin and put billions of dollars of assets on our balance sheet. So it becomes a very virtuous cycle. So that, that works for the early adopters. It won't work for the last country to adopt the Bitcoin standard, but it's kind of like um, if you're an African nation and you're using glass beads as money and someone comes along with gold as money, and if you're the first person to figure out that you should sell your glass beads and you should buy the gold, then the glass beads are gonna go to zero and the gold is going to appreciate and you're going to own all of the stuff in that in that part of the world because you adopted the stronger money, just like people that uh, adopted gold instead of silver. When there's a new monetary system that comes along, if you were if you were using the lira or the peso and the dollar became the world reserve currency, if you converted all your assets to the dollar, well, the dollar is appreciated to be worth 480 pesos from one peso. So if you converted your million pesos to dollars, you've got 480 million pesos now. And the person that didn't convert to the dollar has 1 million pesos and you're 500 times richer than them. So this, this dynamic is going on all the time in the world. You just have to figure out what is the strong asset and what is the weak asset and in a free market, the capital is going to flow from the weakest asset to the strongest asset. And if you, um, if you get ahead of that dynamic, then your family, your company, your institution, or your country will benefit. And if you get behind it, you're going to be the, na the African nation that had the treasury of $87 worth of glass beads, which goes to zero. And people wake up and they're like, well, you were the richest guy on this island. What did you own? Oh, I own that stone coin. Are you kidding me? Yeah. A lot of my um, uh, viewers are big gold bugs. So uh, I'm sure you, you will have riled them with your, with your heinous arguments. But I, I don't want to get into an argument about the merits of both. I'm a, I'm a kind of own a bit of both guy. But um, coming back, Michael, we talked about the three drivers of the bull market the next bull market. And we've covered um, corporate buying and I think we've covered the, the, uh, the I think the, the, the corporate buying was the second driver. The first driver was just the, the amount of capital there is in the world and where it's looking for a home. And, and the third and the driver third is, is technology, the, digital yeah, money. The, the, the micro thing, yeah. Yeah, we, we can end on that if you like. Perfect. Um, go ahead. Well, let's just talk about that. Okay. So right now, uh, we have analog money based on 20th century rails, and all of the money moves on credit networks, the Visa, the MasterCard network through central banks and correspondent banks. So if I have $100 and I want to move it 40 times, it takes about six weeks to settle each time. So it's going to take years, four, six years to move it 40 times. And you lose 2.5% of it in transaction fees every time it moves. So if I wanted to move the money 40 times, or we'll just say vibrated at a frequency of 40 hertz, all the money's gone. It gets, you know, all the money gets eaten by the banking system and it takes six years. So that's the existing status quo. So money, money moves too slow. It's too expensive. The impedance is too much. The frequency is too slow. So you can't do things like like uh, give incentives to the people that do business with you online. If, if I'm Amazon and I want you to buy my book, read the book, write a book review, and then give you a reward when people like the book review or buy the book after reading your book review. I can't do that with a credit network, with a credit card, because there's a minimum fee, $2, $5. It takes 30 days to settle. There's gonna be fraud. 
it's going to be a massive transaction fee. You know, I've got to dox myself to get the money. It's it's just too much impedance. So the the real breakthrough of uh, digital money is I can actually put millions of dollars of Bitcoin on a network, and then I can move it to you with Lightning, and and I could move you uh, a nickel worth of Bitcoin on the Lightning network for a thirtieth of a penny in one second. And so I I can move money instead of uh, charging you two hundred fifty basis points, I can charge you something like one one hundredth of a basis point. So it's going to be a thousand times cheaper, ten thousand times cheaper in transaction fees, maybe a million times cheaper. And instead of taking uh, sixty days to settle the transaction, I can do it in an, about one second. Maybe we'll get to the point where it's 600 milliseconds in that range. But we're talking milliseconds instead of uh, taking days. And if I do that, that means that there's no reason why I can't spend that up and do a, million, a billion transactions an hour with a billion people. And so the real interesting appeal of, uh, of the idea of a digital monetary network is 100 million companies can do business with each other doing billions of transactions an hour for the benefit of 8 billion people settling in a second on a smartphone. And that, that opens up all sorts of high frequency applications. Instead of spending $100 million in digital marketing and giving it to Google or Facebook in order to buy advertising, I could actually just stream the $100 million directly to my prospects or to my customers or to my partners in real time. I got maybe uh, maybe I want the attention of uh, neurosurgeons in London. Well, I can actually set up a system where I pay neurosurgeons in London ten dollars an hour for their attention if they go through a process to identify themselves. I set up the wallets, and I'm I'm very directly uh, giving an incentive to the neurosurgeon. I'm not paying Google to buy the neurosurgeon search term on Google, mm-hmm. and then hoping that the person that does that is my target customer. So that you, you can rethink products, rethink services, rethink marketing campaigns, rethink the entire idea of frequent flyer miles. How about universal frequent flyer miles in the form of Satoshi's? Mm-hmm. You know, um, it, I, I, want you to li- I want you to listen to my 60 minute product overview and then apply for the credit card. It's gonna take you 30 minutes to apply and 60 minutes to listen and I'm going to incentivize you directly by paying you to do that if you jump through my gates. That's, that's something that's not really practical today with credit cards, mm-hmm. but you can do it with a split second with uh, digital money. And But the, the main problem to all this, like we can already do it now, the problem is regulatory. There's t- no, there's a technical problem. You, you can't do it now. I, I just explained uh, why you can't do it for technical reasons. The Visa MasterCard network means that, Sorry, I meant you can do it now on Lightning. Um, you can do it on Lightning because Lightning exists, but only for the past 12 months this has been possible. So we've just moved into a regime where it's technically possible to do it. Now, the issue of, of regulatory hurdles are... You know, those are complicated uh, region by region. And uh, if I was actually using this to incentivize employees uh, to do something that's part of their job description, it might be a taxable event. And so you've got to consider the tax consequences when you're doing it regime by regime. And then you've got to consider the money transfer consequences regime by regime, uh, depending upon the materiality of the money you're moving. So okay. I, I do think the primary impedance for high velocity monetary applications will generally be compliance at this stage. Okay. You're you're correct on that. And that's why that's why um the more likely driver for um for appreciation is long term store of value. Mm-hmm. Like I can buy a I can buy a billion dollars of Bitcoin to hold for ten years and there really isn't any regulatory impedance there. That's a well understood safe harbor for institutional investors. But if I wanted to actually distribute a billion dollars of Bitcoin high velocity uh, to customers in 87 countries, now you've got compliance issues 
right? Mm. Have I done the KYC? Have I jumped through the tax hoops? Have I jumped through the mon the money transfer hoops? Mm. What's the what's the materiality of it? So that's more complicated. Yeah, definitely. I'm just thinking of the implications for advertising. It's enormous. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a much more efficient way to do digital marketing. Like, mm. if if I'm trying to actually find people that um that are my target prospects or my target customer, it's it's it makes a lot more sense to just give them the money than it is mm -hmm. to give the money to the advertiser so that they can attract or send maybe people to me. Yeah, I think in the in the 70s and 80s, advertising was sort of 50% data driven, 50%, you know, the creative ideas of whoever the copywriter and the advertising, uh, the, the, the illustrator was. And it's even now it's like 95% data driven and 5%, you know, creative copywriters and so on. But that it's going to go to like 99.5% data driven if, isn't if it if you think about it deeply right any if the brand is spending a billion dollars advertising in order to get the customer to come to their mobile app or their website or their their store they would prefer to give the billion dollars directly to the customer right there's no there's no circumstance under which it isn't better like I'm McDonald's and I want you to actually come to McDonald's with your child and buy them a happy meal and take a photo and post online. You would very much rather they show up, take the photo, buy the happy meal, post online and immediately get paid $5 worth of Bitcoin. Right? I mean, there, there's no, mm -hmm. that's better than I'm going to spend $5 and spend it, you know, buying display banner ads on a digital advertising platform in order to hopefully get someone to show up with their kid and maybe, right? There's less fraud, there's more authenticity, more genuine nature. Yeah, the same would be true with Coca-Cola or Nike or anybody if you're trying to drive that behavior. So it's just not possible with credit networks now. I got to believe that it should be possible um, in a compliant way um, to do that with uh, Satoshi's. The Satoshi solved the problem of it not being an unregistered security. So, the, I mean, the first hoop you've got to jump through is, are you distributing a token which is an unregistered security, right? That's a securities law violation. So you don't want to do that. So you need a commodity. The second hoop you need to jump through is, you know, is it, um, is it an acceptable use case uh, to deliver this something of value? And is it so much that it trips over a KYC, AML, counterterrorism financing thing. Like yeah. if McDonald's never sends more than $25 worth of Satoshis to a customer in order to post a photo of their kid with a happy meal on Instagram, then, you know, you would think that, that probably a reasonable politician or a reasonable regulator will determine that there's, there's nothing malicious about that. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but, um, you have to you have to move progressively in order to get consensus on those things because otherwise the regulators make your life miserable. Sure, and I guess whichever whichever nations adopt it first and have the most because countries copy each other. You know, oh, it's working in 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 Holland. We'll try it here in Belgium, and so and so it spreads. But the first guy that does it that that goes, you know, we saw them all copying each other with COVID policy. But the first guy that does it and shows it to work, the other countries will quickly copy. Well, yeah, you also have to take the, the high road. For example, the ethical way to do this is to distribute $10 worth of Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. But that costs you $10 of Bitcoin. And then you have to spend seven years perfecting the Lightning Network. And then you have to actually run the Lightning nodes in a responsible way. That's, that's painful. The unethical way to do it is just distribute $10 worth of yo-yo token on your yo-yo network. I mean, and then you just print a billion yo-yo tokens out of thin air, right? And that's the, that's the fast way to do it, but you took a shortcut, you see? And the shortcut uh, is a securities law violation. And so people have been trying to do it the fast and easy way. It just doesn't work, right? The, you know, slow and steady wins the race. Mm -hmm. You have to, do, you know, the way to do it right is you use the, the actual digital commodity called Bitcoin, you use the right network called Lightning, then you hire a lawyer that will actually go and, and, uh, and get the approval of the regulator in the country in question. Then after that, 
you do it in a responsible fashion. It's going to be much more expensive and much slower, but it's going to be more durable. And you'll be able to do that in one country. And then you'll have to go to the next country. And then you'll have to go to the next country. You have to say to France, well, we did it in the UK, and they were OK with it. Are you OK with it? And then we're going to go to Germany. And then we're going to go to Italy. And then at some point, you'll get the EU. And then at some point, you'll get the US. And then you still have to like go and hire a Japanese speaking lawyer to go to Japan and speak in Tokyo to the regulators there to explain how this is OK in France and the UK and it should be OK in Tokyo. And it's going to be very expensive. Right. It's going to be, a, you know, a thousand times as expensive as gin up yo-yo token and just don't yeah. hire the lawyer. And that's why it hasn't happened yet. But now there are big companies or companies like MicroStrategy. You know, and, and we're working to build a product that a Nike or a Coca-Cola wants to use. So you could be sure that, you know, we'll be spending a lot of time on the compliance and the lawyering and the, and the other, other back end issues, which are not sexy, but are necessary for this to become uh, a durable thing. When, when I was in Miami, I heard a speech by Robert Kennedy that totally blew my mine because he was just so articulate about Bitcoin and showed so much insight. How much chances, and presumably if he were to win, you know, a lot of these things would happen a lot more quickly than they would if Joe Biden or Donald Trump was to win. Are you, are you able to comment on how much chance he's actually got? Or is that something you can't comment on in your position as a, as a chairman? I, I, would, I would say a couple of things. One is there are now four presidential candidates three Republicans and one Democrat that have all come out in favor of Bitcoin, right? There are no presidential candidates that have come out against it. And um, Kennedy is, uh, is the number two, he's the front runner, the front running challenger versus Biden in the Democratic Party. But DeSantis, uh, Reg Swamy, and, uh, and uh, Francis Suarez have all come out in favor of Bitcoin in the Republican primaries. So I think um, the writing is on the wall here. There is more popular support for Bitcoin in the political establishment uh, than there has been for any new asset class in the last hundred years. Well, right? that's so, fantastically positive and I'm and delighted. There's no, and there's no negatives. So I think we're in good shape there. That's fantastically positive. Michael, as we close, I'm going to ask you one last question. Thank you so much for your time. Um, in becoming... Uh, and it's a personal question, but in in becoming such a uh, a champion of Bitcoin, you've you've kind of become a bit of a rock star, if you like. You've become you know very well known, the one of the most articulate spokespeople about Bitcoin. And I saw how excited people were to meet you in Miami and shake your hands and get a selfie with you and all that kind of thing. But and that must be flattering and enjoyable. But at the same time, have you taken a lot of flack? Have people been horrible? Have people given you stick? Do you care? Well, um, I think I think Bitcoin is an example of something that um, it's a new idea and it needs public public advocates if it's going to reach its full potential. So um, I uh, I wouldn't recommend anyone uh, become a rock star unless you have to be a rock star in order to pursue your passion. <laughs> There's uh, you know, there are a lot of negatives to being well known. Um, so I, I appreciate uh, the attention. The attention just allows me to be able to advocate for Bitcoin. And, and it's pretty important to get the attention of the 8 billion people because it's a solution. And 99% of them don't know about the solution. They don't understand it. And so we've got a lifetime of education ahead of us and uh, we can't do it door to door. And uh, Bitcoin won't speak for itself, right? Someone needs to speak for it. And the, uh, the enemies of Bitcoin are very well financed and they spend lots of money to attack it. So I, 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 think, um, I think it's appropriate to be an advocate. Um, and uh, I'm comfortable with the role. I guess I... I don't have any other comments. I don't I, I don't do it to get famous. If that's the question, I would, yeah, no, I would prefer to just have the Bitcoin and not be famous. And there's plenty of people that uh, that uh, don't speak publicly on the subject because being a public advocate of anything uh, invites a lot of controversy. 
But in this particular case, uh, uh, I'm passionate about Bitcoin uh, and its role to deliver a utilitarian entitlement to freedom and property rights to 8 billion people. And so I think uh, that merits uh, taking a public position. Good stuff. Well, Michael, thank you so much. And if people want to find out more about you and the work that you do, how, how should they go about doing that? Um, you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is Sailor, S-A-Y-L-O-R. Um, I post um, a lot of Bitcoin-related material on the website hope.com. So remember, Bitcoin is hope, and you can just go to hope, H-O-P-E, and then you'll see a lot of stuff there. And uh, I have a charity foundation uh, that gives away free education, and we've given away education to uh, more than a million students, and it is called sailor.org, S-A-Y-L-O-R dot O-R-G, and uh, it's free. So if you want free education, go there. If you want uh, you know, a lot of resources about Bitcoin, go to hope.com. And if you want my daily musings on Bitcoin, follow me on Twitter. Great stuff. Well, it's uh, been a real pleasure talking to you and I'm very grateful to you uh, for your time. And I hope maybe we can reconvene in a few months and talk further as, as, as things evolve and the next bull market hopefully gets going. But in the meantime, Michael Saylor, thank you very much. And thank you very much to you, dear listener, dear viewer at home or wherever you are in the world for watching this programme. And we'll be back with another episode very soon. Until then, goodbye.